Thank you for your patience, Lori. We are ready to go. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, glad you're joining us. Sorry I won't be able to be on camera this time. I'm having some technical difficulties, but since it's a short meeting, hopefully that'll be fine. Um, so let us start off with item one, cert certification of a quorum. So Emily, since we're all logging in and you can see our names, do we need to call roll or can you identify everyone and, and verify that there's a quorum? No need for roll. We've identified everyone and we have uh, 25 of our participants. So we Excellent. are good with a quorum. All right. Thank you. Okay, so then let's go to item number two, which is approval of the March 22nd meeting. Um, Chad, do you want to review any of that or are we just ready to get a motion for approval? I think just a motion for approval. This Ed Collins, I uh, make a motion for approval of the minutes from the March 28, 2020 meeting. Thanks, Ed. Do I have a second? I'll second. This is Tom Godala, Cedar Park. Thanks, Tom. All right. Um, sure would be a better way to approve these somehow, but I am assuming that um, all in favor, unless I hear any nays. Hearing no nays, uh, let's move forward to item number three. Ryan, uh, let's talk about the tip. Uh, thank you, Lori. Um, so this is gonna be just a quick presentation. I, I won't do a deep dive like I did. Uh, last time, but just wanted to kind of summarize uh, the, the transportation improvement program. Um, so this is the, the 2023 to 2026 uh, tip, and everyone knows it's a four-year program that provides the required regional authorization for projects that have committed uh, federal surface transportation funding. Um, so just in this table here, you've got just kind of a quick summary. Um, we have 14 roadway, roadway projects uh, that make up the bulk of the uh, tip this go round um, about five billion dollars, and then we've got uh, 30 transit projects or, um, totaling about 338 million. And now that includes uh, mostly the operational funds for Capital Metro, um, as well as the City of Round Rock and the City of San Marcos, and then um, pieces of the locally funded portions of Project Connect. Um, we do have 216 grouped projects. Um, this includes all of our bridge rehabilitation. Uh, preventative maintenance as well as our safety programs uh, that are specifically for safety projects. Um, so that's about $427 million. Um, we do have some locally funded projects as well. Um, these aren't uh, subject to the federal requirements, but we are listing them um, because they are regionally significant. And these are mostly the City of Austin bond projects, um, their corridor projects and programs. Um, and then we've also got 64 projects that are under project development. These include our deferred projects, um, but we've got $2.7 billion worth of um, projects that are under development that will likely come back into uh, either later iterations of this TIF in the fall amendment cycle or later amendment cycles or the, the next iteration of the TIF. Um, so all totaled um, funded, uh, currently funded products that are moving forward uh, and implementation, that's about $6 billion um, with those $2.7 uh, billion under project development. So uh, just a really high level summary. Um, if you have any questions about that, i uh, more than happy to take those after we finish the presentation. Um, Emily's gonna talk about the public involvement and uh, the feedback that we did receive. Um, also did wanna take the, the opportunity to thank uh, both TxDOT and Hayes County for, uh, we uh, went out for uh, public involvement and, and went back to in-person meetings for the first time in two years. Uh, so it was exciting to get out there in the region, but I did wanna say thank you to the, the sponsors that uh, sent representatives out to join us for those meetings and talk to the public. Um, on the next slide is um, the schedule. I think we're all familiar with that. Um, we are uh, gonna take this to the policy board uh, at the uh, May 9th meeting and then um, depending on their action, we're going to submit that to the state uh, in June and it will uh, be approved, uh, submitted um, 
to Federal Highways and the Federal Transit Administration in September uh, for approval. So that's when it will become active. Um, um, basically, in early fall, at the earliest it will become active uh, once we get that approval. So until then, uh, the 2021 to 2024 uh, TIP uh, will remain active. And so I'm going to turn it over to Emily to talk about what we heard from the uh, public. Thanks, Ryan. So we had a total of a 32-day comment period that began on March 25th and ends today on April 25th. As Ryan mentioned, we had four in-person meetings, one in Cedar Park, one in Buda, one in uh, West Austin, and one in Central Austin. We also had our robust online commenting opportunity. Our online open house was open the entire comment period, and you could find the draft tip there, a presentation that outlines the project, um, and as well as outlining all of our varied commenting opportunities, whether that was through email, voicemail, uh, fax, or mailed comments. So we had a total of 929 visits to the online open house, and we had 15 in-person attendees across the four meetings we held in person. And we received a total of 25 comments. In those comments, we mostly heard a desire for more pedestrian and bicycle improvements across the region, more active transportation capacity, as well as varied transit options. There was support for the light rail lines, but also desire to see more bus routes um, and support for project acceleration of specific projects. So people would write, I really like this project. I'd like to see it move quickly through the process. And if you have any questions, Ryan or I could take those now. Ryan, Emily, um, so questions from the TAC? Yeah, this is uh, Ed Collins. I, uh, I read through the public comments, and at one time, uh, you know, they're talking about the bicycle and pedestrian improvements. We made a special effort to say, you know, basically it's incorporated into the, the project. You know, there's not a lot, maybe not a lot of standalone projects, but I think sometimes the the uh, public doesn't understand that you know those uh, type of improvements that we're doing now uh, do include those type of improvements for for bicycle and pedestrians. So maybe there's a way to maybe be a little better about you know, education about what the parks entail. I mean, there there are situations, of course, that, that there's no accommodation for bike and ped, but you know it's it's a very rare thing that that doesn't happen. But that communication with the uh, community, I think, would be helpful. Yeah. And I do have one, one other question, and I, I apologize. Uh, Ryan and I have been talking about the fiscal constraint, and uh, and that, that was it was ingrained in me anyway when I was there at TxDOT about making sure that uh, our, all our documents met certain federal requirements, and fiscal constraint was one of those. And I've noticed that th there's a big imbalance, but I think um, in looking through the UTP that made that imbalance of between programmed amount and authorized amount is like a $4 billion gap. And it looked like in the Unified Transportation Program for TxDOT that there may be uh, 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 an oversight that we didn't include about $4.4 .4 billion worth of, of uh, strategic priority funds, which is also known as Category 12. And that would make, including that in, into the uh, financial tables would make the project uh, or make the TIP financially uh, constrained. and. and I would urge the, the campus staff to may, make sure that we don't put our uh, board members into a situation where that, you know, because that, that's when when uh, groups that are opposed to certain projects, they, they look for little chinks in the armor. And, and this is one of those that I don't think that we need to, um, there's a way to fix that particular situation for the financial constraint and not allow uh, some groups to may point that out on their own to the uh, to the board. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but that's uh, I talk more offline with Ryan about it if, if need be. Can you yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I was just going to ask you, Ryan, to respond on both of Ed's points. Yeah, so uh, talking about the fiscal constraints, so everything in the tip is has 
committed funding to it is the way it's listed in the, uh, if you look at the, the financial summary for the roadway section, uh, there's a, a program column, which is everything that's programmed in the TIF and has committed funding to it, and then there's an authorized column right next to it. And that authorized column usually it will not, doesn't match what's on the program side, um, and there's several reasons for that. But the, the main reason is that uh, TPMP provides this, this financial summary to us, and we verbatim take from the financial summary tables in the back of the UTP and translate those over to uh, the authorized column. But they won't match up what's actually programmed because oftentimes you'll have several years of authorization um, programmed into one year. Um, it also doesn't include the group projects, but um, to Ed's point, the, uh, the financial tables in U the UTP only show category 12 on a statewide basis. They don't do it by region. Um, so I'm going to follow up with TPMP because we've been doing it like this for a while. And these authorized programs have never really matched, but I can understand the, the confusion and it does feel counterintuitive, so I'm going to check with them to see if there's a better way of representing that in the authorized column. But I do know that the program column is what they use. And they roll all of the MPOs programs all into one number basically and check the, those numbers against the statewide numbers. So, uh, but that's a good point, Ed. I'm going to have those conversations with TPMP and I'll follow up um, and make sure that uh, whatever results out of that, I'll update the policy board and, and we'll make sure that the TAC is updated on that as well. If it's not changing the authorized numbers um, based on their guidance, I'll add a footnote explaining uh, that discrepancy. Um, because if you look at it a little, you know, the group's uh, projects are another example. You'll see that we're in preventative maintenance. We've got $61 million worth of authorized uh, authorization in fiscal year 23, for example, but we've got zero programmed. And that's only because this is the individual listings. We've got, um, I'm trying to think, preventative maintenance uh, through the life of the TIP. We've got uh, $133 million worth of, of um, preventative maintenance that are grouped, uh, so they're not included in this. So if you look at this, it, it, it is kind of counterintuitive. And then I guess the other point, uh, the other comment that he made about the bike pet, that is a good point because, um, and I think every time we have that comment, um, at least at the public meetings about bike pet and why we're not spending more on that, I do want to point out that if you look at the project descriptions, they do include bike pet elements to it. Um, like I think I mentioned it, that almost every single roadway project that we fund has a bike pet component to it. When we did a, uh, the project call back in 2018, we actually did a breakdown on that number. I can't remember what it was, but uh, we can look at doing something similar. And then also the standalone projects are, of course, um, included in the group projects, so nobody sees those, but they are actually happening. Um, so that's a good point, um, and we'll see if we can uh, make sure that's communicated uh, both to the public and to the policy board. So hopefully that answers that question, uh, those questions, uh, but um, I'll definitely follow up uh, on those. So. Yeah, Ryan, thank you for those explanations. I think, you know, it'll help, uh, you know, this is a public document. That's why we do it is one of, one of the main reasons. Of course, Federal Highway Administration and FTA also use it. But, you know, the more clear that we can make it to the public, I think it helps all of us. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Brian. Anyone else have a question or comment? Okay, hearing none, this is um, an action item for us to make a recommendation to the policy board. So do I have a motion for recommendation? Lori? Lori? Yes. Yes. This is uh, Will Conley. Just wanted you to know I'm on the phone for Caldwell County now. Oh, thanks, Will, for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Lord. All right, well, I'll make uh, the motion for a recommendation. Do I have a second? I'll second. All right, um, so do we have any uh, nays on this? Any concerns? Okay, going once, twice, <laughs> three times. I'm assuming this is a unanimous uh, support for this to go forward. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Thank so you. So, item number four. 
update on the TDM. Mr. Hutter is not feeling well today, so Nirav is going to give us an update on the TDM subcommittee. Hi, Laurie. Uh, thank you, and I will try my best to uh, replace uh, Gary's uh, pr uh, presentations. Uh, basically, on April 18th, we had our third meeting of the uh, regional TDM subcommittee. And the whole point of these first three or four meetings is to kind of build the framework for the regional TDM program. Uh, the last uh, meeting was very uh, data focused and um, uh, the consultants gave us a, a review of both qualitative and quantitative data. And the cons uh, uh, what the data showed was that rural and low income populations have more trouble uh, getting to places like the grocery store, their doctor's appointments, and they also have time, less time for things like leisure activities. Uh, the next step is to have it for the is for the regional TDM subcommittee to have a discussion on regional priorities, which will happen at the next meeting on June 20th. And that's it. Thank you. Wow, that was really fast, Nerv. Um, the first part was was that the results of the survey? I'm sorry, I, my mind blanked there for a minute. Uh, it was a combination of a result from the uh, surveys that were done from um, that were sent out by the TAC. Uh, we had about uh, 1,200 responses and also uh, from uh, focus groups uh, that the consultants were conducting with uh, various groups around the region. Wow. Well, that's a good response. Uh, yeah, before the uh, TAC, uh, we had only had about 127 responses. And then after uh, the TAC, uh, you know, send it out through their networks so that the response rate really jumped up. So I really appreciate the efforts uh, from the tech uh, members in getting that um, survey out and uh, getting the response numbers up. Okay. Well, this, this Ed Collins, I'm serving on the committee as a representative from CARTS. And, you know, that I think, you know, we're moving along pretty good. I'm, I'm happy with the, the consultants and what, uh, how they're leading us through the, the processes. Uh, you know, the, the next thing that we'll be working on is on, on strategies, and they've outlined a, a variety of things that, you know, one strategy, of course, is not going to fit all all situations. And so I'm, we're looking forward to seeing what the consultants come forward with a, a strategies that will help us implement different programs. And, you know, the, one of the things that will also be needed is, uh, you know, seeking uh, funding for to do the, the program once we've identified that. We may not be able to do all the things we want to, but at least some type of uh, continued Funding towards uh, implementing the project, and that those will be you know, part of some of the discussions that'll be coming up here in the future. Oh, thanks, Ed. What is the Nerev? What is the time frame on this TDM study? Remind us again. Uh, the program is a, a permanent program, so they're really, I guess, it's indefinite. Uh, but we, the like I said, you know, at the next meeting we're going to be discussing the. Um, the strategies and the priorities and uh, maybe some, uh, I don't want to say, uh, probably funding requirements or what funding could look like uh, to fund a, to fully fund a TDM program. And that's when eventually we'll have to start going to, you know, the full TAC and the full board about how we want to move forward. Okay, so the committee will come back with some strategies and funding to back to the TAC and then that will be that discussion about those, and then that will move forward to figure out how we're going to get funded with the policy board. Right, and at the earliest that will happen is, I mean, the earliest it can happen is August, but I'm guessing it's more likely going to be October before we have that conversation with the full tag and the board. All right, any questions for Nirav or Ed? Thanks, Ed, for jumping in and providing some additional info. Man, y'all are a quiet bunch today. Okay, um, if there's nothing else on item four, we'll go to item five, report on planning activities, Chad. Yeah, thanks, Lori. Um, so actually a couple of us have some updates on this item, so I'm gonna and hand this around to a few folks here. Uh, Nir, actually, why don't we start with you on the freight, uh, the freight study? Uh, sure. So the uh, policy board at their April meeting authorized uh, the executive director to begin negotiations with uh, Cambridge Systematics uh, on the uh, regional freight plan. Uh, 
and um, those negotiations have just gotten underway. And uh, once we, we get once we get those uh, contract negotiations done and an AFA, then we'll be uh, able to begin work on the plan. All right, um, Will, the next update. Yeah, thanks, Chad. I just wanted to provide a quick update on the interchange bottleneck uh, study RFP. So uh, the, uh, the period for proposals closed on proposal submittal closed on April 1st. We are currently reviewing the six proposals that we received, um, and uh, <clears throat> should hopefully uh, be able to bring a recommendation to TPB in June. All right. Right. Hey, uh, this is Ryan. I just want to uh, the, uh, just do a quick reminder, if anyone's representing um, or can get in touch with the project managers for project uh, progress reporting, uh, we are still missing about 20 progress reports. They were due on Friday. Uh, we are going to be providing the pro updated progress reports to the policy board in May. Um, so if you've not turned in your progress report, if you could uh, sometime today or tomorrow, uh, get those in as soon as you could so we could make sure we're including uh, the most recent information uh, in that progress report. Thank you. Yeah, this is Chad again. Um, just an update on our corridor studies, uh, general engineering consultant, our GEC. Um, that was, of course, approved by the board back in November. And we uh, got approval of our AFA through TxDOT um, just last week. So um, just want to you know, make sure everyone knows we haven't gotten uh, started on that work yet. We're just now in the, uh, really in the scope and, and contract negotiation stage of that project. So we'll be getting that underway. And then once we get, uh, once we get the consultant going, we, um, We'll be bringing um, those studies back to the TAC, of course, to get into the, the, um, all, the all the items we identified that will get that, uh, that process going, dividing up the corridors, prioritizing, and things like that. So um, uh, finally, finally getting that one underway, which we're happy about. Um, that's, all, that's all we've got here, Lori. I'm sorry. I had one more thing, Chad. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, so just to let the TAC know that um, uh, next uh, at the next policy board meeting, we'll be uh, providing them the link to the demographic dashboard uh, for their comments. And then uh, uh, in the next week, I will be sending out a link to the um, to the TAC for a uh, the third dashboard, which is uh, on the road highway uh, network from TxDOT. And uh, we'll be expecting comments, you know, back from the next couple of weeks. And uh, we finally started having discussion with uh, our IT staff, Williamson County's IT staff about how to uh, actually publish the dashboard from our uh, website. And it looks like it's a little bit more complicated than we originally thought. So instead of May uh, for going live with the dashboard, it'll probably be uh, June of this year. Hey, Lori, this is Ed Collins. I, I, I wanted to send out a compliment to the Campo staff uh, regarding you know, sending their presentation out. Uh, in addition to the agenda, I think that helps, you know, kind of solidify the information that being presented. Uh, the uh, in the travel demand management, they sent out their their uh, presentation in a week in advance, and that there's some really good information in there. I think would be helpful to uh, to the group in general because they provide a number of uh, analysis maps that I think would be of interest to uh, people looking, uh, you know, doing planning for the region. Um, so. You know, I, I can send it to you, Lori, or, or Nerv can send, send it to you, and maybe you can decide if it might go out to the, the whole TAC. I would think in general, most TAC members would, would like to see that and share. I know I had a lot of interest in our organization about it. Is Would that be a problem, Nerv, Chad, to just send it out to the TAC? Uh, no. No, we have all that information. Um, yeah, we can send it to the TAC, no problem. Yeah, sounds great. Okay. That sounds well, great. Well, one more one more thing. I'm also serving on a, a committee that's looking at the travel demand model. And you know, there, there are some really smart people out there that we have under contract and uh, they make some really good presentations and they have it on, on video that they're, they're we're talking about um, the impacts of uh, the you know COVID and how it, on uh, working from home and 
how we might incorporate that into into the model. And basically, it's kind of a situation where that their research is showing that you know we had a lot of people up to eight percent working from home, but that number is starting to go back to what the pre-pandemic levels were. So um, anyway, there was a this, this one gentleman who made a presentation. It could be like either a TED talk or a, or you know a TRB presentation, and you know those it, it's a little bit long, but it you know the, those may information that also could be sent out. We maybe we work through Greg Lancaster for, for that. Just it and, and it's kind of the beginning of where we're talking about you know any changes to the travel demand model that's going to be used in the next plan update. Yeah, Chad, we might do something like that. I know we kind of had an outstanding item on the model itself. Uh, there were some questions as you got down onto a much um, more granular level in terms of each city or counties, um, just going back and doing another check on the demographics there to uh, bring it back to the 2020. I think Cole had visited a little bit about that. So I, I do think I know you guys are so overwhelmed, you've got so much stuff going on, but at some point it would be nice to get the group back, um, get that information together as a presentation to TAC. Maybe it's just rolling several of those things up now that we have our our new person to help with dem uh, demography on, the, on staff too. So could we keep that on the list? Yeah, of course. That that has uh, that's been on our list, and it's something that um, Greg and I talk about um, frequently when we develop the um, the agendas for for these meetings. Um, once once we're actually at a at a point of having you know all the relevant information from census and and other sources to present something that would actually um, you know be a useful update to the group. But absolutely, it's on our our list to bring back to this group. Great. Anybody else? Okay. All right. So this is a very quick meeting. I appreciate it. Um, any other announcements then? Uh, oh, I guess that's me. So the policy board meeting is on May 9th. And Chad, could you answer why did um, Mike Ariano not policy board last time on the the whole uh, pickle center. Uh, right, we um, we have to balance those meetings against uh, how long we anticipate they might run, and we had several um, significant items on the last board meeting, um, and so we weren't quite sure how. Uh, how much of a deep dive they'd want to go into all of those items, and so we do have that coming up for the next uh, for the next board meeting. Okay, thanks. It just it reminded me. So our next policy board meeting May 9th. Our next tech meeting tech meeting is May 23rd. So with that, if no one else raises their hand to include any other information, then I'm looking for a motion to end the meeting. This is Ed Collins. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Thanks, Ed. I don't know if anyone else is out there or just their names <laughs> or I'll, I'll second, Lori. Stevie from the city, seconding Thanks. the motion to adjourn. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. I was getting concerned that it was only Ed and I here today, just pretending other people were out there. So, all, all right, right thanks, everybody, Lord. stay safe. Bye. Bye.